an amazing instrument and has developed into an incredible voice in today's music. So many types of guitars, so many styles of playing, all sorts of gear. How does one make their voice be heard as a guitarist? My name is Jeff Floro and welcome to All About Guitar, where we talk tone, we talk technique, we talk gear. Where we discover how we can become better musicians in a world of constantly changing technologies. Where we take a good look at everything guitar. And sometimes not exactly guitar, but just as important. So we can be more successful as a musician in today's music scene. So sit back and relax, and let's explore all about guitar. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to All About Guitar. We have a great show for you tonight. Welcome to the new year. This is my first live show for the new decade. And what better way to do it but have one of my favorite guests and one of my favorite guitarists, Muriel Anderson. Welcome back and Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you. And uh, this is a very, very special show tonight, especially because um, she has a new, a new, I don't know how to describe it. It's an, there's an album in here, <laughs> but there's a little more to it. Um, it's called Acoustic Chef, and it's a cookbook and album. And the songs, we're going to get into this, the songs um, apply, uh, the, the, the relationship between the songs and the food are significant. So we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. And um, let me just explain a little bit. I, I'm really impressed by the fact that how Muriel, uh, the way she's uh, taking her music and pushing the boundaries of, of what, you know, it's not just a song or a, or a musical piece. It's not just a CD. Uh, she's always kind of pioneered, uh, done something a little bit extra. And a perfect example is her last album, which is a pretty highly acclaimed album called Nightlight Daylight. And I'll show you in a minute. It was chosen as one of the top 10 CDs of the decade by Guitar Player Magazine, which isn't a, a, a thing to take lightly. That's a pretty impressive statement and just kind of shows you the craftsmanship and the musicianship of, of Muriel. But this is very cool. I want to show you this. This is the album. And if I'm correct, you've applied for a, is it a patent or a? Oh, no, I, I did a provisional patent uh, way back in 2015, but haven't really. Uh, well, check this out. Now, I'll see if you yeah. can see this. Um, she has LEDs in the CD cover. Check this out. So I'm going to hit this thing, and it should light up. You should see it. That's so cool. And it's still available, but on her on her website, um, murielanderson.com. Yep, I'm correct. That's it. So and this is a great album anyway. It's it's just it's a really cool one. So not to be deterred or, or to to go one step <laughs> further, she now created a, what she calls is a multi sensual experience. Uh, where you're using more than your, your ears to experience this whole uh, the whole concept of this album. So uh, let me just start with that real quick and how this came about. The concept, because you've been you had mentioned before the show that you had wanted to do this for quite a while, and then how it you know how it became how it came to be. <clears throat> well, when we tour, uh, people have kind of come to know that I, I love good food <laughs> when we tour, and. Uh, oftentimes we end up in people's homes and uh, playing music and having some of the most fantastic uh, mm -hmm. uh, food and really interesting food and sometimes we're in the kitchen and you know we, we help to cook and and it's all part of the, the experience is the friendships that you make uh, are enhanced by playing music together and they're enhanced by eating together and they're enhanced by cooking together and so it's it's a quality of life uh, that is built upon many senses, and I, I don't think that we should leave some of them out <laughs> when, when we're talking about, you know, uh, really enjoying life. 
And so I've been wanting to share this experience that I have when I tour mm -hmm. with people. And it's like, well, how do I do this? Well, mm -hmm. we could uh, share some of that in the music from all these different countries. So I really try to uh, experience the culture and, and get some of the real flavor in that music. And so I'm writing in the style of every country that's represented. And I have some special guests in that style. So, uh, for instance, the French song that I have that goes with quiche. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to get a, a real authentic French gypsy jazz player. So I got Django Reinhardt's grandson, Lula Reinhardt, who's playing on oh, this. I'm cool. so excited that, uh, that he joined us. He's playing Phil's on that. And um, uh, the accordion, there's a, a, a beautiful accordion player on the Italian Rory? that just Rory. Rory Hoffman just plays this gorgeous Italian uh, style uh, that that just brings you there and all of a sudden you're sitting in your mind you're sitting there in Italy and you're tasting that eggplant parmesan you know and <laughs> so that's uh, and uh, also, I, I have Brian Allen to do the photography, and he yes, just captures just uh, captures the feel of uh, of where we are and the foods that are being represented. Now, the question was, we we had, we were talking a little bit before the show. Um, of course, you did all the photography. The photography, this food. If you, I dare you to walk, to thumb through this book and look at the food. And not be hungry. I, it, <laughs> you're either sick or you're dead. I mean, it's um, the pictures are just beautiful of what you. And then there's some pictures of them, in you know, working behind the scenes in the studio and stuff. But you, who cooked? We all do. Yes, we Brian and cook? I both cook, and uh, sometimes. And how did hope. you get these recipes? Are they your recipes? Some are my recipes or Brian's. Uh, some come up from my family history, which is from Finland, uh, four okay. generations ago. Mm -hmm. So from my great grandparents, and I wrote uh, a song in their style of that era. That's interesting. As well. And most of them come from our travels. So. Uh, both from going there, like for instance in Italy, we, we learned how to make those Italian recipes in Italy, actually, from families, and in Budapest. From, uh, in fact, I thought that uh, the recipe book was done, and completely done until we went to Budapest. And there I met a young couple, and we went to their home and played music together, and cooked over an open fire we cooked goulash mm. and after the first taste of this goulash i said oh no i've got to add goulash to the recipe book which means i have to write a hungarian tune and so uh, then I, that's when i wrote uh, paprika and uh, found a, a wonderful Hungarian fiddle player to play with me. Can we play a little cut of that? Yes, I have that. Let me sure. take it so you get an idea. It's, it, it really is about the music. I know we're talking about food, and that's, that's a whole thing in <laughs> itself. But here's Paprika. Take a listen. Great. I had to show the goulash, so you guys. <laughs> and there's a picture here of them cooking it over the open fire, like she was mentioning. That's so. from that very first experience, yeah. That is very, very cool. Now, the um, um, so let me ask you this. This is kind of a, a, ten, a tangential uh, question, but how many recipes didn't make it into the book? In other words, do we have enough for book two? There is a book two in our minds, so <laughs> there because there are some that didn't make it, and some tunes also. I, I have a wonderful Japanese tune, and you know I couldn't find just the perfect Japanese recipe. So we're still looking for that perfect 
Japanese recipe, and I think there is a tour of <coughs> Japan in our near future. So I think we have to go. I have to go back to Japan, and uh, you know, the first time I was there, I was really, you know, exploring the music there. And then this time, I've got to go back and really explore the cuisine. Well, some of my my friends that I worked with at Panasonic from uh, Japan, if you guys know something really good, post it on the uh, All About Guitar, and I'll forward it to her and give her some ideas. So yeah, they. They used to cook some amazing stuff. And also, I've never really explored Indian music, and I would love mm. to discover it. it I, it's it's a whole different world, and so uh, so that's it, I think that uh, making some Indian recipes uh, will be a good culprit to uh, really uh, exploring and discovering Indian food. So uh, those are two things that uh, are. Are going you going to get a chance book. to go to India and? <clears throat> In that part of the of the world, oh, well, I certainly hope so, uh, because my my niece just uh, married into an Indian family, and so I think that uh, we're kind of a couple at that. of my friends have gone there, and and I'm sure if you were there, just being in the country will inspire you, because it's just a whole different world. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like what we're over here, you know, and even Europe, it's a totally different type of environment. Even Asia, for example, I mean. Japan and China, they're unique, and there's some really beautiful things and stuff, but it's a whole different thing. It's kind of interesting. All right. So um, so a little more into the process of it. So you, you, uh, you were figuring out, you were writing music to, the, ter to the, um, the nationality, the type of, the style of music from that country to the, the that corresponded to the recipe. It was an Italian recipe. It was going to be an Italian song, basically. Yes. Uh, but sometimes it came the other way around. Okay. Because I wrote a tune for my grandparents. I found uh, an old film from 1929, and when we put it on the projector, we realized that that was during Prohibition, and my grandparents had gotten one of the first home movie cameras. So, of course, they took video of their vacation to Canada where they proceeded to walk into a bar and stagger out, walk into another bar and stagger out. They made the very funny black and white film. And so I took, I said, this black and white silent movie needs its own music. And so I wrote a tune and I call it A Fine Pickle. So now mm -hmm. I've got A Fine Pickle as a brand new tune. So I had to include my mother's pickle recipe. Oh, very so, cool. Yes, yeah, so there is one that came the other way around. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can play a little bit. Do sure, you live, sure, maybe? sure. I can do that. Okay. So I'll play a little little bit of a fine pickle here. Okay. And then that's an, a good excuse for me to talk about this guitar and, and some of the things. We'll kind of get into the gear between the songs. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
amazing now and it feels like a silent movie soundtrack it, you got the <laughs> style you. you got the whole i mean i was like waiting for the piano it was like well it, actually in the the recording i have a dixieland brass band playing with me oh very very, very yeah, cool. so you've got trombone and tuba in there now let me ask you because you're the the, the th and, and this is a good example of that stylistically did you have to do a lot of research to write that or did it just come to you no or? it just came to me uh, I just kind of put myself there mentally you know kind of place myself there and a lot of this is kind of uh, technique that I learned from Chet Atkins and a little bit I learned from Leo Kotke mm -hmm. a different thumb technique but in writing the music in some of the other countries doing like you know a Hungarian tune or Italian tune did you find your did you have to do any kind of research to kind of get the style Yes, sometimes uh, I <coughs> did, uh, for the Hungarian tune, uh, uh, relative of ours had given us a, a recording of an old, uh, really old-fashioned gypsy band, uh, you know, the Hungarian gypsies. Mm -hmm. And so really listened to them and, and kind of uh, gleaned, well, some of it's this really super schmaltzy kind of thing, and then some of it was the was the... Uh, dance kind of thing. The, the, uh, so I used a combination of both and what you heard for that little excerpt was the, the dance part of it and then mm -hmm. the other part of it is, is the, the more schmaltzy part and so I uh, kind of captured that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting so the because it's not easy to emulate those those styles to get that to catch that flavor. Oh what to me. I mean I've, I've heard I come from an Italian family so I'm familiar with certain stuff but I mean, this is pretty broad. There's a lot of different. I mean, globally speaking, there's a lot of different styles here. <laughs> yeah. I don't. That's that's pretty interesting. That's what makes it fun. I mean, uh, that kind of a challenge, that kind of a big challenge like that, is what makes it fun. It what pushes you in different directions. Right. You discover new things. And then also too, the um, uh, how did how did you decide on how to orchestrate it in terms of the of the musicians you used and was a lot of it written out pretty specifically or did you pretty much let them go at it? I did did it both ways. For the string parts I, I wrote out the, the parts that I wanted for the strings mm -hmm. uh, when I hired a string quartet and uh, well for instance uh, the tune J.S. Baklava um, I have I wrote out the string parts and wrote it in the style of J.S. Bach and then in the uh, part where it goes into that Greek little section uh, just happened to be the day I was recording the strings, happened to be the day of the annual Greek festival that inspired the piece to begin with. Oh, and wow. so after recording the strings, I went out and danced Greek line dances uh, to the live band, and I asked the bazooki player, hey, would you record in this middle section that goes into 7-8 time? And he says, sure. And so I let him wing it on, uh, on the bazooki for the 7-8 time part, and then it goes back into the string quartet. Do you want to go ahead and play that? Yeah, we'll play Let's a little play that clip. For, uh, I have a clip of that here. of J.S. Baklava. Baklava. Here you go. Let, take a listen.
Now, let me ask you something about that. That's a I love that. That's a beautiful piece. And Thank there's you. a lot going on in there. Um which guitar was the main guitar that you're using? Are you using more than one guitar? No, I that's only one guitar part. Uh, so that's done solo with, with my part uh, on a 20-string nylon string harp guitar. It's go, so it's got nylon strings in the treble <coughs> part and the bass, and for the super trebles, it has uh, steel strings. Okay. So, uh, but it, I used to... Okay, I that's think, what threw me off, because I heard the steel string, and then it, she's playing basically a classical... Uh, the yeah. main meat of yeah. it. Yeah, but then uh, some in the first part was actually the, baz the bazooki, too, oh, okay. that uh, gave it a little bit of that sound. So it was primarily the uh, the nylon strings and the sub basses. Yeah. Now, yeah. well, let's talk a little bit, because um, you have the Super Troubles, which is a new uh, add-on device that you created. And yeah. I think we need to take a look at this. And uh, you might want to hold the guitar oh, okay. up. So, so this that little part clamps on it comes off so you can put it on any guitar you don't have to use it with on let me take a picture of that while okay. you're having holding it up you don't have to um use it on a harp guitar you could use it she could put it on her classical guitar yeah. and uh use it almost on any guitar you want and it's very go ahead and explain it because it's really cool right on the recording i i use that in uh, a finish tune because it sounds a lot like uh, the Finnish cantala, uh, so I use it on the on a regular guitar, but I also use it on the, on the uh, harp guitar to add range. So it, then you you get a huge range from the, from the high notes to the low. And this particular set of <coughs> strings, uh, I'd asked several builders to make me uh, attachable mm -hmm. uh, super trebles, and finally Lucas Bruner did, and it's now available if you go to BrunerGuitars.com. It's B-R-U-N-N-E-R. Uh, and it's uh, just a little uh, attachment. Comes with a pickup, so you can play live with it on stage. It's pretty live. I mean, we're not plugged in. He, no, she's playing plugged. acoustically. That's that just, thing is loud. Yeah. What's that wood? That's the the board. The board is laminate, and he tried uh, several types of wood. So uh, there's actually several different types of uh, fine wood here, laminated together to give it strength, and it's very stable. So that it took several tries to get it to, to, to be just right, and now it's uh, I I hardly even tune it. Just, it stays in tune. It's 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 brilliant. So I can I can do a tune. This is uh, the one that goes. Uh, I had mentioned before the um, the French one. Okay, that, uh, this is the French so one. You have to imagine a Lula Reinhardt playing here together oh, okay. with me on this. Uh, this is a tune that was written in 1951. Under Paris skies. That's right. So the ciel de Paris sans volume chanson. Elle est née d'aujourd'hui dans le cœur d'un garçon. So the ciel de Paris marche les amers.
et le ciel de Paris a son secret pour lui de Provencer. Elle était près de notre île de Saint-Louis. On est trop jaloux de ces milliers de Il fait grandir sous le son tonnerre éclatant. <laughs> That's great. That's, Thank you. It sounds great. That that little uh, that device is, is 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 it's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about this guitar. This mm -hmm. is an unusual guitar because it's made out of graphite. Yes, and that's only because uh, I flew here today. Uh, I mean, via San Jose uh, from Hawaii, and so this is uh, the first Hawaii tour with a uh, or no, the second Hawaii tour with a, with a harp guitar, and and it was pretty hard in the wood uh, to to go to, uh, spend a couple weeks in Hawaii. So I thought I would uh, bring a. A completely impervious guitar. Yeah, there are a lot. There fiber. are people that use graphite guitars because if they're in extreme weather, they can handle it and they don't go out of tune. They're pretty rock solid. Yes, and and I was confident with the super trebles that those those would be fine, and they were completely fine, very stable. Uh, so uh, that was the, the purpose for the uh, graphite guitar this time. Who makes this? This is made by Emerald, and it's Emerald. made in um, Ireland. Ireland, that's right, in Ireland. And my regular harp guitar is uh, the wood harp guitar is made in Portland, Oregon, by Mike Doolin. Well, okay, Doolin is the one. Is that the classical? Yes, that's the classical one. A harp guitar, and that's made in. in that's in uh, Seattle. Portland. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Portland. But there's uh, qu quite a few uh, builders now, harp guitar, more than there used to be. So I think more and more people are building these instruments. Yeah, I've seen more in, at, at uh, the NAMM show, too. But I've not seen the classical one that you usually play. Mm -hmm. Now, this one's steel string, but she usually plays a classical six string in it with the drone strings. Yeah. Which is interesting. And then, well, what you heard on that, that other clip that I played with the classical guitar... It sounds like three different people because the character of each instrument is totally different. So you have the the big bass strings, and then you have the classical guitar, and then you have the the the, uh, the steel. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it, it's one of the few instruments that has steel and nylon on the same instrument. Right, right. So, but though this this guitar with the steel strings, it, it's an interesting sound. Yeah. Though I must admit, it must be hard on your nails. That uh, I have to sand my nails frequently. Yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> that's the problem with steel strings in your nails. It really it goes. Let's talk a little bit about this other guitar that you were playing previously. We might as well get into that right now. Okay. While I'm thinking of it, because I will forget. Now, this guitar is your main six string that you use. It's the main six string I've been touring with. Yeah, and okay. it's uh, it's a camps guitar. Uh, the ones I generally record with is a, the Tierra Negra uh, flamenco, and that's designed by uh, the duo that I. Uh, I've often toured with from Germany. Uh, now, this is a Blanca, right? Yes. And I, I never thought that I would <coughs> gravitate to a flamenco guitar, uh, but after uh, touring with uh, Tierra Negra, I just really noticed that it, uh, the, the immediateness of the sound is, is very nice for, for all, all types of music. And so if I'm playing like a Sousa march. <laughs> I get a lot of the different sounds, you know, the instruments. Or if I'm doing a Stevie Wonder tune, you know, like this. I'm doing a 
Japanese tune. People, that is not easy to bend like that on that guitar. So there's a lot of different types of techniques that I do to kind of capture the feel and the sound of uh, whatever kind of music I want to play. Yeah, no, I, I see a lot of guys using more of the flamenco guitars because they cut well live it really does help but the way you play a lot of it's the way you play but also too the guitar is well balanced it has plenty of depth to it it doesn't get too boomy yeah and it's um but and and it's well it's a well balanced instrument so this one is a cedar top if i'm correct or spruce let's see uh, let's see this one is spruce. spruce and then the back is what uh cypress this is Cypress? Yeah, so it's a, a very typical, uh, that's your standard uh, flamenco. The Cypress, that's the wood that's plentiful and, and cheap in, in Spain, historically. And that's what they... Now your, ne your negra is, um, the top is still spruce? Uh, cedar. Cedar? Cedar on that. But you know, the, if I'm playing bluegrass, I'll, I'll go play a Martin Dreadnought, you know? And so yeah. that's a, a, a whole different sound that you want. Uh, well, in, in fact, there's actually one tune in the the new book, in the uh, the new CD, uh, Acoustic Chef, that I wanted something to go with uh, the roasted roots medley, mm -hmm. roast root vegetable mm -hmm. medley, and so I thought I would do a roots medley, a medley of roots tunes, uh, and each fiddle tune having something to do with food, starting with tater patch, and so for two weeks, all I did was flat pick on a uh, on a flat top and just uh, just to try to get my flat picking chops back you know yeah and uh, then uh, we recorded with my very favorite fiddle player uh, Michael Cleveland just mm -hmm. great fiddle player Mike Bubb on the bass and uh, then on claw hammer banjo I have Jack Pearson and we had a great session and on the way home there was a traffic jam I said what's this traffic jam everyone's turning left into the horse barn and it was the night of the full moon picking party in Nashville. And I just happened to have my Martin guitar and a strap, and I had been flat picking for three weeks. And so I turned left into that barn and just played in jam sessions until the cows came home. Came home. Now, let's, do you have that uh, yes. pulled up? I'll play Let a me, little bit of... Uh, this is called the um, tater, tater Patch. patch. Tater. Here, take a listen. <laughs> It's 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 you're a you're a great flat picker. Oh well, thank you. It's like 
totally would not have, from all the other music I've heard, you know, most people with fingers that play with their fingers play with their fingers. They're not as much of a flat picker, but man, you just went to town. Well, it really helps to be playing with, with those guys, with Mike and Cleveland and Mike Bob and Jack Pearson. I mean, they, they uh, uh, inspire you to, to, mm-hmm. to play. So. That, that, is, that is really good. That's some good stuff. I love it. That's a Martin? Yeah. That was a Martin. Martin D35. Now, I'm going to ask you, I want you to go back to this guitar real quick. Yep. Uh, so this is a spruce top. What was the back? Cedar. Cedar. That's Cypress. a cedar back. Cypress. And then... Oh, the sorry, sorry. Cypress. Cypress. I, I'm sorry. Cypress. Cypress and then, back and sorry. And then the, the Negra was a uh, cedar top, but what was the back and size of the Negra? Rosewood? Uh, or mahogany? Let's see. I have one that's rosewood, and then uh, I actually have one that's cedar. It's a, it's a Tierra Negra model, but it's, but it's, it's, it's uh, sorry, uh, yeah, but cedar back inside, so I, I want oh, okay, yeah. so it could either be, mm-hmm. it, all right, so the, uh, that's interesting, the, uh, mm-hmm. because those woods are, that's more, would be more like of a classical type, mm-hmm. the, the, the cedar top with the rosewood. Yeah, that's more, it's more conventional. Yeah. But what I want to ask you is this little device that she has. That's she places it on her knee. I've never seen this before, oh, yeah. and it's so cool. Um, I, this this is a neck up, and the only reason for this is uh, for my back. It just props the guitar up and makes it much easier on the back when you're playing, uh, and you can just sit flat footed. And you don't have to have the little footstool. Don't need a footstool. Don't, don't don't need to don't uh, like this, cross your legs. You know to prop the guitar up in the right position. So it's. Uh, you know anything that you can use to prop the guitar up uh, a little bit. <coughs> now you have it on your right leg. Do you, you don't when you play strict classical? Do you do it like that? Uh, no, I found that uh, with the neck up, it's it's actually just as comfortable to have it on the right leg as the left leg. Mm-hmm. So uh, it allows for just a little bit more motion, a little more movement to have it on the right leg. That is great. I so mean, I like the to way move when it, I play. it does, uh, mm-hmm. it does give you brings the guitar up where it's in the proper position, so you're playing relaxed. Your yeah, I, I use some of these these notes up here. I know that I know there's no money up in these no th- these notes here. That's, but yeah. Tommy Tedesco said all the money's <laughs> below the fifth fret. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's where all the money yeah, is. Right. So, but no, that's true. It it, it because. I see how you're play- when you're playing, especially your uh, your left hand. It's it's relaxed. I mean, and you're at the right. It's the right height. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's really uh, been been helpful over the years. Right. And you basically now on some of the tunes. Oh, I'm trying to remember the first one we had played. The the low E string was tuned down to what a C or a D. A D. A D. Yeah. Down there. That is that is pretty rich. That D low D. Yeah. And, and that's a that's a blanca flamenco. It's really yeah. clear. Yeah, you could uh, just by changing the angle of your fingernail and fingertip, you, you you can go from having that bright sound to to a pretty uh, rich sound. Uh, and I use this this kind of guitar for uh, a tune like this. This is the one that I call the immigrant. This is inspired by my great grandparents. So I wrote in kind of an, an old Finnish waltz.
Beautiful. What's nice is that it's not too the the bottom end doesn't overpower. It's well balanced. As you're going up and down, you're you're hitting the middle strings a lot in the melody. It's very consistent. Good. I'm it's, noticing that that guitar is really balanced. Well, thanks. It's uh, you know that's the same guitar that I used to <coughs> a few minutes ago in playing Superstition. So it's, it's yeah. fun the the really real variety of tone. No, it's a real versatile guitar. But I think that the using the the flamenco guitar, it does it has a, a clearer low end. It's it's brighter. And that's a problem with some of the classicals that I play, especially the rosewood. Some of the rosewood ones, uh, they get real bottom heavy. They get bottomy. Mm -hmm. um, now, let me ask you this: What strings are you using? Uh, I use my signature GHS strings. Okay. So I've been really happy with uh, GHS. They uh, they intonate beautifully, so they're they're very pure sounding strings. And I asked if they could make a string that uh, the third string could be just a little bit. Uh, thinner, so it would be less tubby sounding, more the same sound as the first and second strings. And so they found a titanium alloy that's used, and so now these are uh, uh, these are signature strings, and they call them uh, Muriel Classics. And I, would you consider them a, a, a light gauge or a medium gauge or a, a, a forte? You know, yeah, that's, they're the standard gauge that most people use, which is called hard tension. Uh, but the sixth string is a little bit harder yet because that's the one that I take down to detuning or if I'm playing flamenco. That's the string that I want to really lay into mm -hmm. uh, the sixth string. So it's so in either case, I'd want a little bit more tension on the sixth string, so that's that's why that is a little mm -hmm. more. And that, that doesn't pose any problems on the guitars. You don't, like electric guitars, uh, I was just, a friend of mine brought over a guitar and she had like a slinky bottom. The high-end strings were mm -hmm. really slinky and the low-end were higher, mm -hmm. were, you know, higher gauge, and it twists the neck a lot of times. You don't have any issues? No, that, uh, no problems at all with uh, you know using it in all different guitars. It seems to uh, be a real standard gauge, and that, mm -hmm. and having the, a little extra tension on the sixth string doesn't it's, doesn't yeah. hurt anything. Well, you're moving yeah. around, you're changing tunings all the time too, so it's yeah. not as. But still, that's uh, the guitars are really they they the balance. Whatever you did, you did it right because it's a really balanced set. I mean, oh thanks. You know, it's uh, it would seem sometimes it, it's. Do you find you have to work to bring out, like if you're playing a piece where you have middle voices, and that's mm -hmm. usually the the telltale sign of a really good guitar or a so-so guitar, mm -hmm. the middle voices. If you're playing something polyphonic and you're trying to get those middle voices out, it sounds to me like it's pretty effortless. Oh, yeah. That, I don't even think of that. It, they come out uh, very easily. And when I amplify, I, I play with EQ a little bit. So uh, my concerts that I'm doing this week, uh, I'll be uh, going through both direct and and mic and oh really and so you do so both I, I do both uh, sometimes I get such a great sound out of the direct I don't need the mic uh, other times I'll use a microphone just to bring a little bit of the reality uh, the realness out of the high end so I get plenty of a really good sound of the low and mids and then use the, the mic just to now get a what's more the high. pickup that you're what's the system you're using on this uh, the camps has uh, their own their own system that they use so it's, yeah all it's, it's, that's all you know, through and then my other guitars I get the um, rich Barbera pickups because mm -hmm. there's a separate pickup for each string so it's like having six individual pickups and that way it can be balanced so one string isn't louder or softer than the other now yeah. live what mic do you use that's an interesting question. Yes, it, it, I have found a CAD microphone. It's designed for cymbals. <laughs> That's what I use for the, the guitar mic. It's a small uh, microphone. Small and capsule. It's, yeah, it sounds a lot like the Neumann KM84s. I used to travel with a Neum, uh, an old Neumann KM84. Uh, disappeared uh, some gig someplace. Uh, and, uh, and then I found the CADs, and, and it, it's uh, such a similar sound. Uh, they're very easy to tour with. Do you, is that just to give a little more top and air to it or and then you use you get more of the bottom end from the pickup or is it does it sound pretty deep for it, they, they they both sound pretty <coughs> they both sound pretty natural yeah so that's the object because a small it capsule more. it's interesting like these are pretty big capsules so that it gets the the low end of the guitar really well but I'm surprised that a little capsule like that a little like 
it's like a pencil type type of microphone that would get that. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask you, when you record, what do you use mic-wise? I, I have a wonderful microphone from Germany. Uh, it's a, a stereo Luke, uh, 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 Bronner microphone, the uh, Dirk, Bronner. Dirk Bronner. And that's what you use primarily for the gu- guitar? Uh, yes, I've used that. Uh, and now I, I found a, a little Sony microphone that I supplement that with, so I have... Uh, been using the stereo mic uh, plus a little Sony off to the side. And then, and you use that for both the classical and the harp guitar? Yes. And when you do put that that mic, the the uh, the Dirk Browner, uh, how far? Do you, how, do you pull it away? Uh, I have it a, a reasonable distance, so maybe eight inches away or so. So it's uh, it's not too far away. Uh, so it's, it's six to eight inches. And you put it. You put it by the sure. uh, the twelfth fret. Uh, yes, near the twelfth fret. Twelfth fret, and it's it's a just a it's a stereo mic, right? Stereo it's mic. So yeah. include. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting. So that's uh, yeah. It, it captures most of what I need to capture. So then there's um, a, a similar kind of sound. We used the the Sony mics to on the uh, on the vocals on the you know, you know there's one that we haven't done yet that. Uh, uses uh, these Sony mics uh, that is my favorite cut on the in, uh, entire Acoustic Chef, which is the Tuvan Horseman. Okay, let's go ahead and play that and then let explain to me what you were using. Well, on that. And, or do you want to do it now? Well, maybe we should explain now because we should tell people don't turn your radios off, that it's supposed to sound like this. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Because this, uh, uh, they're singing. Uh, the, they're doing the Tuvan throat singing, which is getting two different sounds out of their voices at the same time. So it's getting this high whistle that's actually a harmonic that's coming out of their throats. And then they're, they're getting this low kind of sound like a sheep there, and that's coming at the, at the same time. And so it's, it's, it's amazing the, the different kind of things that they're doing with their voices during this. So I tried to write something in their style and uh, do you have the, the whole cut of this or the, or the clip? Uh, no, I just have the, the clip, clip, but okay. it, it shows it, doesn't it? Yes, it okay. does. So All this right, is take a important. listen here. That is great. I haven't heard anything like that since Penderevsky. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> we're out of time. I knew this would fly by really fast. What I really want to talk about really quickly is this next week of uh, she's going to be playing all around town if you're in the L.A. area. Um, Thursday, January 16th, she's going to be playing at the House of Blues, um, Women of Fingerstyle Guitar, and she'll be there at 7 p.m. in it says uh, 8.30 p.m., or is there two sets? Uh, let's see. There's three sets. I'm playing in the 8.30 set. The 8.30 set. Okay. Mm-hmm. So she's playing on the 8.30 set on the at the House of Blues. Then Saturday, uh, January 18th, she's returning to the Ruth B. Shannon Center at Whittier College, and uh, she'll be that's with Andy McKee. 
Andy McKee, I'm really looking forward to Saturday's show. That's going to be great. That should be fun. Then the 19th. That's 8 p.m., I believe, right? Okay, you didn't have a, num a time. Okay. I think that's... So maybe 7 30. Sorry, 7 30 p.m. Well, it says 7 30, then it says 8 p.m. So usually they're at 8, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So I'll get there at 7 30 to be there early. Yeah. Go to my website, murielanderson.com. Yeah. It'll, it'll be right there. <laughs> and then the 19th, on uh, that's Sunday, she's at the University of Laverne, the Morgan Auditorium International Guitar Concert, and at 6 p.m. And then the 23rd, the next week, she'll be at the Museum of Making Music in Carlsbad at 7 p.m. So uh, check that out. And then her murielanderson.com is her website. Check that out. And you have to get this one that lights up. This is so cool. And Acoustic Chef. And this is just great. Um, I want to thank you guys both for coming down, Brian and uh, Muriel. Uh, we only got a few minutes, so what are you going to take us out with? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say, if you go to my website, click on the link that says Acoustic Chef, murielanderson.com, then click on Acoustic Chef, and you can listen to all the cuts and check out all the recipes right there. So, oh, very, very cool. Sorry, sorry. Yes. And if you have any leftovers, send them here to me. <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll try them out. Anyway, thank you so much. It's, it's uh, great to have you again on the show. And both of you guys, it's, this is a wonderful project that you guys did, and I look forward to part two. Okay. And... Uh, Everybody else, I'm going to let her take us out. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Muriel, take it away. Mm -hmm.